Even though they're getting harder to find these days, camcorders are still popular. Plenty of people love to use them to shoot their kids' sporting events. And no recording limit and no overheating issues means that they're great for like church services or weddings. They can be used for ghost hunting. And what about for storm hunting? Yeah, don't try this at home, but with a DSLR, you gotta futz with all the controls. A camcorder, you just focus on staying alive. On this channel, I have reviewed a few camcorders from Sony so far, the very popular AX53 and the more prosumer AX700. But I wanted to see what the offerings were from Panasonic. So this model is the Panasonic 991K, which I'm reviewing in this video. It was discontinued. If you happen to have the 981, it's essentially the same camera, so this video will apply. The difference is that the 991 has a second tiny camera right on the LCD screen. Now the 981, even though it doesn't have that little camera, allows you to take a feed from a secondary camera from your cell phone and use that as an inset into the image. And we'll get into how that works a little later on in the video. But besides that secondary camera, they're basically the exact same camcorders. They have the exact same sensor, the wide angle is the same, they capture the same size megapixel still images, picture quality, aperture, low light will all be the same. The cameras even look almost identical. Now there is a model WXF1 and that camera has two cameras built in like the 991 that I'm reviewing. However, it does have a different sensor, a different lens, different stabilization. But this camera does share some of the bells and whistles that the 991 has, which I'm reviewing, like some of the cinematic features in slow motion. So if you happen to have this camera, you could learn something about it as well in this video. Finally, Panasonic has some HD camcorders, which we're not going to be reviewing here. So this is not a new camera by any means. It was actually introduced in 2016, and in many ways it's kind of showing its age. It's kind of funny, there's one feature which Panasonic touted on its website, a baby monitor feature where you could use the camera when it's hooked up to Wi-Fi to check in on your baby while it's in the crib. This is before home security cameras could be found everywhere. So this is going to be a full review of this camera with many video examples. So whether you're looking to buy it or you already have it and want to learn a thing or two, stay tuned. We're going to look at all features from basic to advanced, stabilization, autofocus, low light. Who's this camera for? Does it make sense to get it? And we'll also compare it against its big competitor, the AX53, and against a couple of other surprise cameras, so stay tuned. The camcorder boasts a 1 over 2.3 inch backside illuminated BSI MOS sensor with an 8.29 megapixel effective resolution that combines with a crystal inch and 4K image processor to support 4K UHD video at 24 and 30 frames per second and 1080p video up to 60 frames per second. What the hell does that mean? It means you can expect to get videos that look like this. Not bad for a 2016 camera, right? But I'm not sure if you notice something in one of the scenes. All right, let's go to the videotape. If you look at the left part of the frame, you see like a weird distortion and the scene is almost like breaking up. And I think this is due to the stabilization and I think the fountain caused some sort of issue here. In this particular scene, I still see it, but it's not as pronounced. And I'll show you some other scenes where it really didn't show itself again to be like that. So I think that was just an aberration. Here's an example of the really strong optical zoom, 20 times zoom from really wide to tight. And you can also get an idea of the stabilization. Here's another scene with water. I don't see that same issue that we saw with the prior fountain. I think this scene looks pretty good, nice and sharp. It was windy, so it's not quite as stable as it could be. I am hand holding this. It's always best to use a tripod at extreme zoom levels. But wow, look at that range. Now in this scene, I did have the camera set down on this ledge here. So you can actually see the passers by without any shake. And you can see the detail on the trees. This is at 4K 30 video, 
No processing to it, no editing. Autofocus. I wanted to get a shot of this guy's cool looking beard, but the camera just back focused. It did not pick up the face. Too bad because that would have been a nice shot. But otherwise, I think the autofocus in this camera does work fairly well. Like in this particular scene here, I caught this guy driving the horse and he caught me, noticing me shooting him. And this furry friend, almost camouflaged in the leaves, still got the focus on the eye. It got the ducks, no problem here. And a real tough test is in low light. I've done this scene with other cameras around dusk, shooting a helicopter with low contrast, and a lot of times it would hunt. In this particular camera, it held on pretty well, so I was impressed with the autofocus in this tough scene. Now, if you're gonna vlog with this camera and walk, you may wanna see how stable it is. It's not really great for that. There is a box around the white box. So it did sense that I had a face. Very nice of so the camera to sense that. The telemacro lens allows you to get tight macro type shots and you don't have to be right on top of the flower like in this case. You can be a few feet away at a safe distance. So if you're shooting a bee, you don't have to worry about getting stung. I'm scared of bees. I'm scared of snakes. Now it can shoot in 4K video, but it can also shoot in 1080p if you prefer. And here's an example of the 1080p 60 video from the camera. Now it does have an electronic viewfinder. It is a very small viewfinder, but I will say it's nice and clear and sharp. So that's an advantage. And unlike most DSLRs, it can tilt to give you an angle advantage. And when you pull it out, it automatically starts the camera and opening the LCD also starts the camera. And when the camera starts, the lens cover automatically opens. The side of the camera reveals a micro HDMI and some other ports. You have the battery compartment on the back and there is one SD card slot for the camera. And yes, you can hook up an external mic to the camera. There is a mic port near the front of the lens and a headphone port near the backside of the camera. And there is a Hachu under a flap on the top of the camera. Now, if you record in AVCHD mode, you can take advantage of the 5.1 channel audio. There is a red record light that goes on on the top of the camera when you're recording. And this button here is to control some menu items when you're in manual mode. The zoom switch on the top of the camera is pressure sensitive and you'll get three zoom speeds out of it. This is the slow zoom speed. Pressing it a little harder will zoom in a little faster like this and harder again will get you the fastest zoom speed. And this is an example of the stabilization. And that really fast zoom speed can be used for dramatic effects like right here, just zooming in real tight on these people who you could barely see at full wide angle. But one thing I noticed is that at full tele, the image tends to soften up a bit and lose contrast. And this is not uncommon with these type of zooms. A press of the photo button on top of the camera will get you a nice picture. While shooting video in Central Park, I thought this scene might look good if it's a picture, so here is what it looks like. So I think it looks pretty good, but I found that if you start zooming with the camera and then take pictures, the pictures get progressively worse as you start zooming in. It gets a little fuzzier, harder to stay focused. So if you're gonna use the photo feature, try to use it at wide angle to get the best results. And if you're recording in 1080p, you can actually snap a picture while you're shooting video. Panasonic has something called an intelligent zoom, which gets you to 25 times. Now let's take a look and see how effective that is. We're going to focus on the top of the old Citicorp tower building. Here it is in full optical zoom to give you a point of reference. And now this is the 25 times intelligent zoom. You see a little more grain in the middle there compared to the optical zoom but still usable. There is a digital zoom option. Let's take a look at that. We'll look at the 60 times feature. 30 times digital zoom. Maximum digital zoom. You can see that the autofocus suffers. There's an increase in video noise. Everything is really tough to keep stable and it's kind of a mess. Try to avoid this. I'm glad you made it this far into the video. While I got you here, just please take a second to like and subscribe. It really does help the channel. Got some more videos on super zooms in the works, which I think will interest you. Now, I did promise you a comparison. The Sony's very popular AX53, and that's coming up right now. You're gonna see some scenes right now. One shot with the Panasonic, one shot with the Sony. Your job is to tell me which is which. Can you do it? Okay.
video with the AX-53. This is 4K video. So let's zoom in a little bit now. Do you know what this is? This is the Sony, actually, AX-53, and here's the Panasonic. Mainly you can see sort of like a white balance color difference. They both look kind of close in terms of sharpness, but look, it's more stable on the Panasonic. I'm just able to hold it steadier. This is all handheld. And I think stabilization is important, especially when you have high zooms. Low light is also important. Now, here is a shot in a very low lit room. This is the Panasonic, and I'm actually surprised how bright it looked. Now, when we switch to the Sony AX53, you're going to see it looks a lot darker here. Now, there's grain in both. No small sensor camera is going to do really great in low light. So this is a really tough test for all small sensor cameras, mind you. But in this particular case, since the Panasonic is brighter and they both have grain, I think I'm going to give the edge to the Panasonic in this test. Okay, this is my dead butler just in very, very low light without any night mode. So let's turn night mode on in the menu. And this is night mode color. You could see how much brighter it is, but wait, if I move the camera just a little bit by just a couple of inches, so you have to be perfectly steady. To achieve the brighter image, the shutter speed really gets slow, and that's what's causing the blurring in this particular case. And this is night mode infrared. And you can see how creepy it is. As I stand back though, the effect does kind of weaken. But you can see it's actually like a spotlight, uh, invisible to the naked eye. And there's one more trick to use in low light and that's a video light that's in front of the camera. You have to turn it on in the menu and the annoying thing is once you do that, in order to turn it off, you gotta go back into the menu and do it again. It's really like a spotlight that creates a deer in the headlight type of look. That is blinding. Woo! The brightest blinding light ever that you see. So let's take a second to compare this Panasonic camcorder with two very capable still cameras by Panasonic, which I recently reviewed, the FC300 and FC2500 with the one inch sensor and see how they all do in low light. Now here is our Panasonic 991 and this is the FC300. This is the one inch FZ2500, which I reviewed. And you can see there's a lot less grain and the larger sensor is helping that. Now I reviewed that little FZ300. So while I had it out, I wanted to test it in full zoom mode here. The 991, this is what it looks like at near its full zoom. And this is the FZ300. I think I still prefer the FZ300, a little sharper just looks a little more vibrant. Now we're gonna get into some of the more advanced features that the 981, 991 can do. So you need to go into the menu, into the manual mode. The menu is very confusing and very unintuitive. You do get used to it after a while. And in the manual mode, you can make adjustments to your iris. You can adjust your shutter speed of the camera, white balance and autofocus as well. There's also another page where they have something called level shot, which I was not able to get to work. It's supposed to level out the image when you tilt the camera slightly, but as you can see here, it really didn't do anything. So back to the menu, by hitting one of the arrows on the bottom, then you go into something else, which is called menu. So that takes you to another page where you have record, setup, picture. The Panasonic camcorder menus are laid out in a strange way for me. I guess I'm used to the Sony menus, so maybe it's just something just to get used to. But on the record setup, that's where you have a lot of the parameters that you can adjust, uh, such as the sound. Picture adjust is something that's kind of professional where you can actually change the sharpness, for example, of your image, the color, the contrast. This is default sharpness. If you feel your picture needs a little extra and you don't wanna do it in editing, you can do it right in the camera. Here is the picture boosted to plus two, which I think is even a little too much. And at maximum sharpness, it's way too much. The camera is fairly sharp, even at its default. I think it still looks fine, but it's good to know that you can make changes uh, inside the menu. Another potentially useful feature I wanted to check out is something called stabilization hold, where you actually press this icon while you're shooting and it'll make the image more stable. I'm not pressing the button. Now I'm pressing the button. 
just released it. Now I'm pressing it. Just released it. Let me show you what Panasonic calls its 4K cropping tools. Now there's something called stabilizing crop where it'll actually stabilize the image afterwards to reduce some of the shake. Something called post tracking where you can designate someone you want the camera to track. So this might work in a sporting event. You shoot at wide angle and then you touch on the screen for the subject that you want to track and the camera will attempt to track the subject. You have to have good light and good contrast. Like in this case, the red jersey really is contrasted against the green grass, so it may not work that great. Post zooming is another feature, and it's called zooming crop in the camera. You press the start of your position, and then you designate where you want it to end, and it'll give you a nice smooth zoom speed, whether it's fast or slow. Now realize if you do video editing, you're probably aware you can do something very similar in post-production, but not everybody is into editing or they don't have the computer for it, so it's nice that the camera can do it this way. And since you're shooting in 4K, you do get good resolution when you zoom in. Another feature is called post-panning. And again, this is using the 4K resolution to create an effect afterwards. Many times our pans are jerky, especially if you don't have a tripod. What this effect does, is give you the ability to smoothly pan from left to right or right to left. And once again, you select the start position, you select the end position, and then afterwards, the camera will create the effect of a smooth pan. Slow motion has gotten very popular these days, and the 981-991 does have a few slow motion options. You access them from this icon in the menu, and the first one is called Slow and Quick Video. And these are 1080p effects, not 4K. By pressing the button, you can literally go from slow motion to quick motion with one press, which kind of creates an interesting effect. As you can see, it was slow motion, press the button, and it went to a fast effect, and now back to slow motion. Now what makes the regular slow motion unique is that you can activate it while shooting video. You don't have to turn the camera off and go into a special slow motion mode. So here is regular video with sound. When I press the button, it goes into slow motion. The slow motion doesn't have sound, but it's very cool that you can just really do it on the fly and it's nice to see the transition. Now I released it, so I have two more times remaining. I don't know why it's arbitrarily three. And here we are back to slow motion. It's only one slow motion speed, by the way. So back to the slow motion menu, and there's something called slow zoom. This is a little bit redundant because, as I mentioned, there are three zoom speeds with the rocker switch, but this just gives you an extra slow zoom speed if you want to use this. Just something that you should be aware of that it has. Sometimes it's nice and cinematic when you zoom in nice and slowly. Now the final effect in the slow motion menu is something called dolly zoom. This is an effect you occasionally see in the movies and it gives the impression of moving into your subject while at the same time moving away. It's a dramatic effect and this in the camera allows you to recreate that. The pre-record effect is great if you're into birding or turning back time. So what pre-record does is a little bit like time travel, you know, like in Back to the Future. Uh, in this upcoming scene, I actually hit the record button right after the bird flies out of the scene. A uh, bird just flew out of the frame. I just missed the bird. Or did I miss the bird? 4K Photo is a special mode where you can grab a still image from the 4K video. So in this example here, shooting down from the street below, I'm shooting in the 4K Photo mode. I can review all the footage in the camera after that, and then when I find the frame I want, like in this particular image, I grab it. And this is kind of a nice, useful effect. So let's talk about the second camera to see if it's a worthwhile addition or just a gimmick. The little camera on the edge of the screen pans 270 degrees and can also tilt up and down 20 degrees. And the second camera's video is a little rectangle. You can't change the size of that rectangle. You also cannot change the aperture or exposure of that little camera. 
and the wide angle is not very wide considering that it's used to shoot you you would think it would be a wider angle but it's not to me it also looks a bit overexposed and you can't change your mind later the video is permanently in the corner you can't take it out but if you find that you really like to narrate your videos and you want to show yourself doing so then this might be a viable option there's also an audio narration mode which emphasizes your own voice as you're speaking since the camera rotates, you could also twist it so that it's looking to the side, maybe as a spy camera. That's kind of a creepy use for it, but I guess you could. So it could be almost like a, I guess if you want it to be like a spy camera, or move it to... So both the 991 and 981 allow you to use a cell phone instead of that little low quality second camera if you want to have like another video inside your video. In order to do that, you have to download the Panasonic imaging app. You have to set it up and go through a few steps. But then you can see you can use your cell phone footage and that would be inserted in your video. As I move the camera, and you can also, if you want, flip the camera around to get the other perspective. And if you really love this feature, you can use two cell phones as little video inserts into your video. So do I recommend this camera? Is it for you? Well, it depends on your needs and expectations. If you want something light and easy to carry around, you got it with this camera. But on the negative side, it's also very light. A lot of reason is because it's very plasticky and in a way feels kind of cheap and fragile. But it's a camcorder and takes really nice images and it has only one lens and you don't have to change lenses and it's easy to work with and it won't overheat and there's no recording limits. You don't have to worry about that. Now there are some nitpicks. Some people have complained that the headphone out is disabled if you use a non Panasonic external mic. So I would check that out. I have not tested that myself. That's something that may have been fixed in a firmware upgrade. But if you're a professional, I don't think you're gonna to be too worried about a using external mic too often with this camera. This is great for family events, for vacations, maybe for a B camera, for a wedding, for church ceremonies, for long form events, or just general shooting. You know, even for some light wildlife because of the long zoom, it does have a lot of possibilities and the images that come out of the camera are really good and do hold up surprisingly well against some of the more expensive Sony models like the AX53, which is very popular. And the Panasonic even offers features that the AX53 doesn't have, like the ability to control your image with sharpness, color, and contrast. So all considering price-wise, the Panasonic actually looks like a pretty good deal compared to the Sony. Camcorders are a shrinking market right now. That could change down the road, just like vinyl LPs were shrinking at one point and made a resurgence. But for now, they're harder and harder to come by. And in a shrinking market, do you think this Panasonic the 991 or 981 makes a good choice based on what you've seen? I'd really like to know in the comments section. And I look forward to seeing you in the next video.